What's one rule that your school slash workplace has implemented that absolutely backfired? My high school banned girls from wearing any shirt that exposed their bra straps because seeing a bra strap would give high school boys evil thoughts. Most of the girls in the school responded by wearing the same shirts they'd always worn without bras. As a teenage boy, it was a happy couple of weeks. The school tried to then mandate that all female students wear bras until a male teacher asked a 15 year old if she was wearing appropriate undergarments or not. She called him a pervert. Her parents, who thought the whole dress code thing was as stupid as most of the students, threatened a sexual assault harassment against the the school. Everybody in charge panicked and it all went back to the way it was before they tried to change anything. Would give high school boys evil thoughts? I wish school administrators would give up this stupid reasoning already. They can easily just cite professionalism as their reason to force kids to dress a certain standard and not be in the wrong. Like if boys want to walk around with their pants sagging and their underwear hanging out, tell them to fix their clothing because they look like slobs. No good reason to treat the girls any differently. During our general meeting last week, the owner of the company went on a bit of a rant about negative reviews of management on a popular jobs website with a green logo. He demanded that we stop posting negative reviews immediately and shamed anyone in the room who had done so. As you can guess, people doubled down and posted their grievances on the same day as the meeting. The green logo company doesn't take too kindly to that sort of behavior. Seriously, they will terminate service if management is caught doing that. Report it. At my old company, different coworkers eventually fessed up to which reviews were theirs. Almost all the negative reviews were true, and the company now hardly exists anymore. Go figure. Because of rumors of a drug problem in the school, there was, the administration decided to drug test students. The media jumped all over that. Violation of our civil rights or something. The initial statement was that anyone who failed the test would be kicked out of school. After the 40th or so kid failed, they changed the policy to mandatory meetings with the counselor. After the 100th kid failed, they hired another counselor. Our school just brought in drug sniffing dogs that would randomly come into classroom. The thing was, the sheriff's department would always be parked in front of the school before the first bell with clearly marked canine cars. So anybody who had drugs would see the cars and just skip school that day. Absences increased massively. If you signed up for any extracurricular activity, including sports, clubs, band, etc., you were also signing yourself up for the possibility to be randomly tested. I got tested once and it was right after I got foot surgery. So of course I tested positive for painkillers. The school nurse even had them locked up in her office if I needed them. The school admins threw a huge deal about it to my mom, and needless to say, she was not very impressed. My old boss tried implementing an incentive scheme for the underperformers, while anyone who consistently did well received nothing. Three of us quit within a month. I worked somewhere that had an incentive program for top earning departments. They announced in advance that they were discontinuing it. Everyone, while not thrilled, was okay with it because it was only a small sect of employees who were eligible and they kind of knew it was bull because no one else in the organization was eligible. Come to the month it was supposed to go away, they accidentally issued every employee another bonus. They weren't giant bonuses, 300 to 500. They immediately announced they were going to pull them back over the course of the next three paychecks, taking 30, 30, and 40% of the bonuses back each check. Our entire department quit just walked what's funny is that in a similar result to your situation the departments across the company who were underperforming they didn't get the bonus so none of them quit they lost their best performers over what equated to about a 2k per location bonus my high school did something like this they hand out these tickets to teachers to give to students to incentivize them to behave better. Well, most teachers gave them out to students who normally behave badly if they were having an uncharacteristically good day. Meanwhile, students who always behaved well got nothing. It didn't really backfire for them because the well-behaved students didn't care enough to rock the boat. I did get a couple because I had one teacher who would wait until the end of the year and give them out to the students with the best grade in his class. Trouble was, by then the candy bars were gone and there weren't t-shirts left in my size. All that was left was office supplies, Mardi Gras beads, and t-shirts either too large or too small. We used to be allowed to stream music and such on our computers. Spotify was an approved program and would come installed on your computer. Someone complained about productivity despite us always doing our work, and so they banned streaming of any kind on our computers. But now everyone just listens on their phone, so you walk around the office and nearly everyone has their phone out now, so it looks even worse when sponsors come into the office. Yo, Pandora, Spotify, and YouTube are easily my best work friends. Banging out emails all day without listening to music would be borderline unbearable. Strange that they'd make a stink about Spotify causing productivity, but I have seen some offices ban music streaming because their office internet bandwidth slows to a crawl when everyone is running Spotify on their computers. 
Work instituted a point system for being late or calling off sick. Accrue too many points and you get written up, fired if it continues. They doled out the same number of points whether someone was a minute late or called off altogether. And if an absent lasted up to five days, it was still only one absence. So anyone who overslept or encountered heavy traffic and was running late would just stay home for the rest of the week. After several months, they decided that being late was only worth half a point. I used to manage a casino that had the exact same type of thing. The way it was abused is if someone was running late, they would call to say they were on route and could you please not give them a demerit? If you refused and said that they would get one, they'd just say, okay, I'm canceling my shift then. Same demerit, so why not take a Friday night off? Upper management never figured out how the system was stupid and refused to remove it, so we just stopped handing them out. Side note, it is better to reward good behavior with incentives rather than punishments for bad. One month, no late, no cancel, free meal. Two months, half a day off with pay. Compare this to lost time for lates and no-shows. And so on. I worked at a place with that system. I missed 14 days total in increments of three, but only got docked three points. In my defense, it turned out I was allergic to the product we made there. A type of plastic, the one they used to make chairs. And that's why I ended up missing work so much. That's the one workplace I wish I could have made work out because I adored the job, my coworkers, and my boss. But the job itself didn't like me. Back when I worked at Disneyland, they had a system like this, and I believe most, if not all, departments followed it. If you called in sick, you received three points. You could call in sick for up to four consecutive shifts on the same three points. On the fifth shift, you were put out on a leave of absence and required a note to return. If you were late, you received 1.5 points. Depending on your status or seniority, you were written up based on the number of points you accrued in a selected amount of time. For example, 9 points in 3 months, 12 points in 6 months, 24 points in a year, etc. The points would fall off one year from the date you initially received them. Here's the kicker. They also have a call-in option called dependent. A dependent call was zero points for up to three consecutive shifts. When that was first instituted, it was meant for people who have dependents that they need to care for at home, namely children or elderly parents. At the time, you had to qualify for it by having these dependents listed on your tax forms with HR. If you didn't, you got three points. Later, Disneyland was forced to open the option to all cast members, but revised the policy to limit all dependent calls to single shifts, no more consecutive shifts, and cap them at four a year. They were use them or lose them, and they'd reset on January 1st. Furthermore, the CM would have to say who they were caring for, kid or mom. Do you know how often people called in dependent on January 1st? Most of the time when they left their voicemail, we could still hear the party going on in the background. It wasn't unusual to have massive staffing issues on January 1st because people who were not scheduled to work didn't want to come in because they had already received the day off or wouldn't answer the phone. And these kids were calling in to care for their grandmothers. Seriously. I don't know if Disneyland still uses that point system, but in theory, you could miss about 25% of the year if you watched your points carefully, balanced your sick and dependent calls, and were never late when you did show up. In our office, we were not allowed to have more than 14 consecutive days off. So one guy booked a cruise for a month, booked off 14 days, then one day back, then another 14 days off. He called in sick his one day back. Here in the US, some people don't even get 14 days off a year. If I remember statistics correctly, the average was 13 days per year. Edit, after a quick search, public sector is 20 to 22, private is 13 to 15. Edit two, I'm just posting averages. The range is from the fact that it comes from multiple Google results. Many people in the US are replying that they have a lot more or less. Keep in mind that this is averages for all jobs in the US. We weren't allowed to be friends with kids in grades above us, but we could be friends with kids in grades below us. That rule didn't last long. I feel like a lot of these could have been avoided by stopping to think for a few seconds. This is something you reread and then reread again in disbelief. I'm not even sure that counts as a backfire. That's just a facepalm. At an industrial site I used to work for, they introduced an absolutely no overtime policy. The people that most commonly worked overtime were the maintenance guys. They had to cut out their preventative maintenance in order to make their hours while being available for all shifts. It took three months of daily breakdowns before they decided to try something else. Honestly, having three shifts worth of maintenance guys doing things round the clock would be far better than my last job. I was part of the maintenance group for an aging 50-year-old power plant and the management upstairs decided that only operators worked in shifts. Maintenance had to make do with only 8 to 5. Overtime for the workers barely existed and since I was a frontline supervisor, I wasn't being paid anything at all to oversee them when things went into overtime because I was reclassified as salaried while still being dinged for being late or taking leave due to them giving us issues for the number of leaves compared to the rest of our country and our industry. The place I worked at did something similar. 
We worked a 40 hour work week, five days at eight hours each. Here in Australia, after 38 hours, you get paid overtime. So each week we got an option, either two hours overtime pay each week, or we could take off two hours early one day. Usually Friday, it was often half and half with who did what. So there would still be a few mechanics to do any work. Management made a change where there was no overtime to be taken at all, unless we got written approval by the GM. So we all started taking off at 1.30 on Friday, leaving the workshop deserted. So they started making us do a seven hour and 36 minute work day, five days a week. As a screw you, we would just not finish up and sign off any of the equipment after 1.30 on Friday. It was still going that way when I left. The mess that place turned into is why I never finished my apprenticeship. My old workplace did something similar. We used company trucks, so they instructed us to start cleaning up at the job site early so we could get back before the eight hour mark. The problem was that it usually took a lot longer to finish a job that way because of all the wasted time driving, setting up, breaking down and driving back. A job that could have been done in one day with two hours overtime now took two days to complete. But hey, at least they weren't paying overtime. Boss insists that lunchtime is from 12 to 12.30. No exceptions. Lunch is not paid time. The second day, he comes in hot to trot with something for me to do between 12 and 12.30 and needs it done right away. I look over at my clock, which says 12.09 or whatever, and say, you said yesterday that lunch is from 12 to 12.30. No exceptions. And went back to my sandwich. If I don't get paid from 12 to 12.30, there's no way I'm working for free. We have the same thing with smoking breaks. I don't smoke, but I see my colleagues doing this. There's a fixed schedule which group can go to the smoking area at which times. Result? Smokers declining or leaving meetings or tasks mid-work to go for a smoke at the right time. So much trouble, but yet the management did not change anything. I had the exact same conversation with our boss. He insists lunchtime is unpaid, no exceptions. So we insist we don't work at lunchtime, no exceptions. He still doesn't get it. College removed chairs in the cafeteria so people wouldn't hang around. Now people just don't eat at the cafeteria. It's a ghost hall and most of the food is thrown away daily. Really sad. They did this at my school and a whole bunch of people just sat on the floor. Frankly, the floor was pretty disgusting, but it got them to put the tables and chairs back pretty quick. You'd think for the exorbitant college prices, you'd be allowed to hang out anywhere you want. Any support call lasting longer than 25 minutes must be reported to higher ups for review. I.e., if you have too many, no matter if it's your fault or not, you get a disciplinary review. I implemented the rule of politely hanging up on a customer as close to 25 minutes as I can and call them right back. I'm sorry, I'm experiencing a small issue with my phone. Is it okay if I call you right back? Gotcha. Outgoing calls are not reported or recorded. It's amazing. Bosses are idiots sometimes. Man, ever since we instituted that rule about not having calls go over 25 minutes, our employees have gotten really good at keeping their calls to exactly 24 minutes. It's amazing. Any software related to the job, whether written inside or outside company time, belongs to the company. Me. So if I write and release malware at home, it's the company's problem? The clause was immediately removed. That's hilarious. The company I work for now is the same provision with the exception you can get written approval from the admin for that piece of software to be your own. All printers were defaulted to print two-sided and you were unable to disable that feature. The thought process being that this would one, reduce paper waste by literally cutting consumption in half, and two, prevent people from printing out personal crap on work printers. This was decided by a committee of people, primarily from HR, who were tasked by the CEO to find ways to reduce costs and improve our corporate culture. To improve our work culture, we basically decided that we'd be annoying about work printers and then we'd all sing together and have a coke. What ended up happening instead was that corporate finance had a fit because you can't or shouldn't print financials double-sided and the IRS doesn't take too kindly to getting filings delivered to them in that fashion. Reverse the policy? Nope. Just force areas to add blank pages into documents so that we trick the printers. HR then implemented their new Justapost system where you were rewarded for turning in anyone who was doing personal business on work computers or on work printers. The problem was that a stunning amount of personal business was actually stuff like employee benefit stuff. Filing insurance forms, submitting flex pay receipts, scanning your transcripts for our tuition assistance program, etc. While the VP of HR decided to go full on antagonist and say that employee benefit stuff wasn't work related and needed to be done at home on your personal PC, our chief legal legal officer came down as our voice of moral reasoning to say that that was bull, and only then did some of the stupidity unfold. The printer thing was done officially once the CAO and CFO started getting double-sided financials. When they complained, their underlings gave them time studies to show the financial cost of having highly paid CPAs do crap like insert blank pages to trick printers instead of, you know, doing accounting and stuff. 
Wow. How messed up do your decisions have to be that legal is the voice of reason on behalf of the employees? At that point, the only thing you should take away from this is that HR is about to cause lawsuits for the company, the literal inverse of what the department is supposed to be doing. My friend worked at a technician at a place that did installation for telecom, sound, cable, pretty much anything tech related, really. The techs were paid by work order completion. Each job had a value that got paid out when you finished the work order. The experienced techs could finish more jobs in a day and made some seriously good money. They were motivated to work faster to get more jobs done, but also to do it correctly, because having to go back within a certain time window and fix a problem didn't pay out, so it lost money. Well, some new management came in and decided to change everyone to hourly wages. Their idea to make techs focus on getting the job done right and not rushing it. All the really good techs saw a massive pay cut from it and immediately quit. The rest of the techs suddenly had no reason to finish jobs quickly since you got paid the same whether you did two installs or 10 installs in one day. So everyone just started slacking off. Within a few weeks, the orders were backed up so bad, install dates were pushed out for a month or more. And when people finally did get their stuff installed, it took all day instead of a couple of hours. That one change completely screwed over the company. Nothing like greedy management to completely mess up a good thing. There's some video on YouTube from a guy who does car work on this. He reenacts per hour and is sitting there slowly removing paint off a quarter panel with the tiniest tool he has, asking if it's five o'clock over and over. Then he switches to the per job version, grabs this huge air powered sander and buzzes it all off, spray paints it in the new color, then peels out of his garage. No cell phones in high school. Security collected them when you walked in, put them in Ziploc bags, and locked them up. They lost like five people's phones. If I was the parent, I'd file a police report for a stolen phone and a small claim suit for the value of the phone. I'd be petty. This one is too easy to work around. Unless you have to totally empty your pockets for security and walk through a metal detector, just hand them a dummy phone. No one expects a kid to have more than one phone.